Brigadier General Koenig, Commander UK Base, United States Army, presents U.S. awards to Canadians. The recipients are members of the Special Service Force composed of American and Canadian Army personnel who fought together in some tough spots in the drive into Germany. Silver stars go to Sergeant G.A. Rainville of Bonneville, Ontario, to Staff Sergeant J.K. Knight of Wolford, Alberta, to another Westerner, Sergeant D.F. Peterson of Cardston, Alberta, and to the representative of Scanterbury, Manitoba, Sergeant Prince. Private R.J. Scully of Windsor, Ontario receives his star. The Bronze Star goes to Sergeant W.J. McGee of Toronto and to Sergeant Barnett of Montreal for deeds of outstanding bravery. During the enemy's last hours of control in northern Holland, a spirit of wild fiesta reigns in towns and villages freed by the Canadian drive. Behind are the grim years of famine and oppression. The bands play and the people welcome the dawn of a free new day. Old Dutch veterans of colonial wars parade to celebrate liberation. The Dutch standard is again raised over what was the palace of a British monarch of the House of Orange, King William III. Hollanders hail the harbingers of freedom as town after town is emancipated. Proclamations are read and posted announcing the resumption of normal government. The years of slavery for a peace-loving people have reached their termination. Grimmer scenes are enacted as collaborators are rounded up. Marked Hollanders who trafficked with the enemy meet with horror the day of retribution. No consideration or mercy is shown the people who sold their honor for a handful of now useless Reich marks. in northern Holland mingle in a mighty crescendo as B-Day approaches and the time of final peace looms close on the horizon. The second service women's convalescent home in Canada opens at Harrison Hot Springs, B.C. The famous spa comes under supervision of the Army Medical Corps. Here, girls of all branches of the service recuperate from injuries and illness. With home-cooked food available in large quantities, there are no complaints when chow time rolls around. The mountain resort's famous sulfur pool gets a big play from convalescent quacks. Wrens amuse themselves by modeling in clay. They find it more amusing than slinging the mud. For some WDs of the RCAF, a back-to-the-land movement has started. For the outdoor types, there is plenty of amusement in the mountain playground. After a pleasant convalescence, Canada service girls are fit to get on with a job that is spelling victory. Little Norway, fighting symbol of a temporarily occupied country, closes up shop at Gravenhurst, Ontario. For several years, the training center has been Norwegian territory. Thousands of flyers have been trained to take their place in the air war against Germany. Now the training planes are crated for transport to the United Kingdom. Here, training will continue closer to the native soil of Norway. Many souvenirs have been collected by the flyers during their stay, and many live Canadian pin-up girls will be sorry to see them go. The lads have made a lot of friends in Canada during their stay. Now it's time to say goodbye and push off across the sea. At a final inspection, Princess Martha and Crown Prince Olaf have a last word with Canadian dignitaries. So until we meet again in times of victory, it's skull to little Norway and many happy landings. Meteorological section RCA makes observations to help their comrades on the guns register accurate hits. A pilot balloon is released. A theodolite is used to measure the altitude of and get bearings on the balloon. 
From these measurements, the prevailing wind speed and direction can be computed. This knowledge is valuable to gunners who allow for the correct windage when laying down fire. An anemometer on the station roof gives surface wind speed and direction. The hydrogen-filled balloons are released every four hours. Observations are made on them to a height of 13,000 feet. From all the observations, a mean reading is worked out mathematically. It is telephoned or radioed to all the artillery regiments. Thus, science directs the brute force of our barrages, which have swept away the foundations of the German Reich. Heavy Ack Ack opens the drive to outflank Emden. of the 2nd Canadian Division move up the road near Dingstedt towards the objective of Oldenburg. Little resistance is encountered except for the occasional sniper. They are dealt with summarily and the advance continues. River, the Highland Light Infantry of Galt and Kitchener board the storm boats for a waterborne assault on Lair. Leaflets are fired on the garrison demanding its surrender. Jerry does not respond, so the attack gets underway. Engineers of the 16th and 20th Field Companies run the ferry service. On the heels of the infantry spearheads, armor is floated across the Ames on rafts. <laughs> The attack progresses favorably. Supporting fire is poured into enemy positions by batteries of number four light ack ack. shambles. Emden is outflanked and the enemy flee in confusion. The last hours of a beaten Germany are made hideous by the guns which have beaten him to his knees. Prince Bernhardt of Holland joins Canadian staff officers at a conference with German commanders on the Holland front. At a schoolhouse in Ochterwelt, the German staff arrived to arrange details for the Allied movement of food into starving North Holland. A truce is declared as the Germans are brought to and from the meetings by Canadian transport as food lorries converge on the enemy lines. Several conferences are necessary before all matters are settled to the satisfaction of both sides. With the food goes a convoy of Dutch doctors to look after their sick countrymen. At the German barrier, Allied MOs join the party to look after our wounded in enemy-held territory. Finally, the signal comes, and the convoys move through the enemy lines. 150 lorries driven by Canadian drivers take the precious commodities to hungry Hollanders. At the unloading point, food is quickly unshipped as German Provo patrol the area. Thousands of Hollanders have existed on a starvation diet. The cases of allied food represent the difference between life and death to the war-stricken population.
hope comes to Holland with nourishing food. Gone are the grim days of starvation. Hours of oppression are numbered as victory looms on the horizon.